welcome to the Lubbers Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. Just like always, you're with Ian. And with Mike. And together, we are rereading the Aubrey Matra novels of Patrick O'Brien, and we are at the beginning of The Wine Dark Sea. Mike, would you mind catching us up on where we got to last time and where we might be coming to in this episode? Thank you, Ian. Would love to. Well, last time in Chapter 2, we learned that an underwater volcano had caused all the injuries, destruction, and Lieutenant West's death. Stevens fears that Dutourd would recognize him from their Paris meetings were allayed. Jack was unsure what to do with Dutard because he had no letter of mark and rightfully deserved to be hanged as a pirate. Tom took command of the Franklin, but found he had to bear in mind the sectarian makeup of the crew, so he did not put Vidal, a nipper darling, as first lieutenant over the Sethian prize crew. So hmm. this time, Lieutenant West is buried the gun room is changed by the arrival of the ransomers from the Franklin over to the surprise and the prisoner detoured, and Martin continues his decline. There's a new acting lieutenant, much ado about sex. Now, that's sex, S-E-C-T-S, religious sex, not oh, yeah. the yes. other one. <laughs> not, not, not gratuitous sex. Yeah, no gratuitous sex on this one. Yeah, that was Clarissa <laughs> Oaks, right. There's a possible petrol link to homeopathy, frisky midshipmen, beautiful music, and potential trouble aboard. Oh, very good, Mike. Well, we always know that O'Brien's in his happy place when actually it's the midshipmen who are beautiful and the music that's frisky. But never mind. <laughs> never mind. We'll make do. We'll make do. It's fine. It's a solemn start to the chapter here, isn't it? Uh, O'Brien opens giving us the kind of bold coordinates of the site of West's burial at sea. And if you want to find out where that is in the Pacific Ocean, there's Tom Horn's excellent Canonade.net website marks those coordinates in the middle of the Pacific Ocean there with a golden pin. This means that there's a newly promoted acting second lieutenant, as you said, Mike, and this is Henry Vidal. Um, he's a nipper dolling. He buys West's formal uniform coat at the masthead and he and his Shelmastonian nipper dolling friends remove all the lace, remove all the ornament. They're getting rid of all the marks of rank and he wears this remaining jacket, looking rather severe, at the gun room's welcoming dinner for him. And Mike, as I'm looking ahead here, it feels like a lot of the chapter, certainly a lot of the meat of the chapter is in this dinner, and looking at the social situation and how it's changed since West and Davidge were in the gun room, and what's really going on between all the different members of the gun room. We've got there Granger acting as the head of the mess since Pullings is away in the prize. We've got two civilian ransomers, men who were taken from the ships that were prized to the Franklin and had been ransomed to ensure release payments. We have Stephen Maturin. We have Adams, the captain's clerk. We have Nathaniel Martin. And we have Mr. Dutour, invited at Jack's hint by Adams. This dinner, I mean, we, we can remember actually, you know, only just a chapter ago, how awkward the dinner had been to welcome Granger and how social tensions... A class tensions had been part of that. But it seems at first glance like this is much more welcoming and much less tense. And we should wonder as the chapter goes on, Mike, whether class divisions and mutual suspicion are behind us or not. There were the three civilians, as we said. There was the host Granger, whom Vidal had known from childhood, and Dutord, whom Vidal had found particularly sympathetic. So there's this quick mention here of a connection between Dutord and a member of the gun room, which we might have to come back to later. And meanwhile, Stephen, who, as we all know, has never said an unkind word about anybody and is known to be a kind of genial presence here. And Mike, surely, surely therefore, this dinner is going to go with no tensions and no drama at all, right? Right, right. We're thinking, hey, you know, Granger, high tension, you know, big setup. Is this going to go well? This one, we're thinking, this is going to be a piece of cake, right? Well, at the dinner, we're invited to consider these newcomers and their contrasting characters the ransomers themselves, they're just delighted to be free. They're laughing for no reason. They're sharing jokes, one of which is about a man who decides not to marry a woman because somebody tells him that she's wiser than he thought he was. And, and you know, his punchline was, you know, I, I, I don't need a woman that's any wiser than however wise she needs to be to know the difference between my bed and somebody else's. So, Ooh. you know, a little, a little poke at marriage, a little poke at women here. I only mention this because, you know, we're going to see a little bit of this throughout this chapter here. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's such a contrast, uh, although in some ways, 
echoes a little bit about Clarissa Oaks too. So yeah. Stephen notes with interest that the ransomers seem to be on good terms with Dutard. And we're thinking, wait a minute, that's the guy that captured him. That was the guy that was holding them to ensure yeah. the bounty that was going to be you know, sent back. But you know, they seem to be getting along with him pretty well. And Dutard is really hard for Stephen to read. He sees Dutard every day. You know, Dutard comes by the sick bay. And Dutard had made no comment about Stephen's French fluency. We remember Stephen was pretending not to speak it very well. Seeing Stephen speaking with his patients there, he realizes it. And Stephen is really wondering, particularly, he said, you know, here's this guy who's lost everything. And, and as O'Brien writes, and that everything was sailing along under the lee of the surprise commanded by those who had taken him, Dutard, prisoner. So it's like, wait a minute, he's sitting here eating with his captors. He may be hanging. You know, all his dreams about this colony might be going up in smoke. The, you know, the ship that he bought and the crew, they're all going to be gone. And he just seems to be enjoying his dinner. And Stephen wonders, is, is he indifferent? Is he stoic? Is he generous, forgiving? But Stephen knows that this is not a guy that you would, you know, mark with levity here. He treats serious matters seriously. He's also very highly intelligent and has a, an inquisitive mind. So I think Stephen's kind of signaling for us, like Stephen is always saying, let's pay attention to this guy. What's he doing? And at the moment, he's questioning Vidal and the two ransomers about English municipal government. Hmm. Huh. So, you know, I think you know, this chapter is full of breadcrumbs from O'Brien, kind of leading us on a trail here. Yeah, he's, he's really interested in, in the ways in which men get set in authority over, over other men. And let's have a look at how that um, emerges as we go through the chapter. So we've got the happy-go-lucky ransomers. We've got Dutour, who's this apparently very stoic, very generous character. Then we've got the honoree, if you like, of the dinner, which is Vidal. He seems to be respectable, at least the way O'Brien seems to write him. He's respectable precisely because he doesn't have the show and that slight air of pretense that we get from Dutour. He's very, very level-headed. He's a middle-aged master mariner. He's in some ways more like a reader than a seaman in his outward uh, aspect. He's got the gravity of a churchman, but he's not a holier-than-thou, a holy Joe type. He can cope with ribald humor. He can laugh along with his messmates, along with the youngsters, his cousin, the bosun. So there's a family connection there. And reflecting on all of this, Stephen's mind wanders over to the topic of the paragraph, which is authority. And he thinks about where it comes from, whether it's innate or acquired, whether it's different from power. He ponders the probable Latin etymology of authority, this word auctor, Latin for an originator or a promoter, all of which I think is good breadcrumb material, Mike, as you say, for what's going to come later. As he's been wool gathering about all of this, he realizes in one of those awkward Stephen moments, there's been a silence at the table and people are looking at him. So, you know, it's Dutard who crosses Stephen's hawes here, Vital. Yeah. Vital says, the gentleman, Dutard, was asking what Stephen, what the doctor thought of democracy. And Stephen says, well, I can't say because naval tradition forbids talk of religion, women, or politics at the gun room table. Yeah. You know, I remember we were talking about this and you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm kind of 100% with Stephen at this point. But... Yeah. You know, then he seems to spoil his own argument with what he goes on to say. Oh, As, Steve. You know, right. You know, Steve, what are you doing here? He suggests that it's good policy because, for example, says Stephen, it prevents somebody from, you know, wounding another gentleman by saying, and O'Brien writes, he does not think the policy, referring back to democracy here, that put Socrates to death and left Athens prostrate was the highest expression of human wisdom or you know, by quoting Aristotle's definition of democracy as mob rule, the depraved version of a commonwealth. So, you know, it seems as I can't tell you my opinion. Perhaps he just landed his opinion on him. And Dutard, is, it, the debate's on, he says, well, can you suggest a better system? It seems as, whoa, whoa. Those were the words of a hypothetical gentleman in this example. I certainly can't tell you my views because, you know, we don't discuss politics at this table. So, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm with you, Ian. I'm, I'm kind of wondering, is this Stephen wanting to kind of, Dutard's been perhaps filling the ears of others and Stephen wants to put a contrary opinion, but wants to do it while saying, you know, we don't talk politics and now we can stop here. Or, or if there's something else going on here too. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if, 
I think we're invited to suppose that Dutour has got an intent of getting people on side. I think Stephen's probably got the half felt intent of trying to put a bit of a, a stopper over Dutour. But I think he made a misstep here. Like if, if somebody said to me, oh, you can't talk about X and then proceeds to expound their own opinion of X hiding behind the rules of civilized conversation, I think that that's the, that's the action of a mere scrub or, <laughs> or some other epithet. And I'd be looking for a chance to get my own back. And I'd be building up a little bit of a grudge if I was Dutour at this point against Stephen, who's been a bit passive aggressive here, despite you know, he, he could have just stopped this by saying we don't discuss politics, but he kind of twisted it a little bit. And now it's, it's festering here. Uh, we, we turn to the ransomers for a rescue of this conversation. It looks like it's going to be okay because they turn back to making uh, the same statement. They say, we agree, no politics at the table. <laughs> But then they go on to say, well, we don't want to talk about politics. We want to talk about how to make money and about enclosure and about, you know, and they're starting to slap Nathaniel Martin on the shoulder here as somebody who clearly likes the idea of tithes and likes the idea of making a quid. But it's dumb, isn't it? What, what they want to talk about is, in fact, politics just by another name. Huh. So Dutour, bless him, is the one who gets to mend a fence and... I think Steve, Stephen missed out on a big opportunity to manipulate the conversation here. Dutour gets to wrap this up by being very, very generous, apologizing for offending against tradition. Stephen goes along and says, I'll take a glass of wine with you. Granger then explains to Dutour that he doesn't have to stand or doesn't have to drink the loyal toast at all, but Dutour does that and is very happy to drink the health of a king and ingratiate himself in the gun room. And I think Dutour is winning here. If this is you know, the Wimbledon final of moral advantage tennis then Dutour is 40 love up at this point. Nice. Nice. Well, later strolling on the quarterdeck, Martin tells Stephen that an odd, disturbing thing happened to him earlier that day. He saw what may have been a Hanneman's petrol huh. and realized that he really didn't care what kind of bird it was. Stephen says that they've never seen a Hanneman's petrol. Martin says that's why he's so disturbed. You know, this change in his feelings reminds Martin of clergy who wake up one morning having lost their faith, no longer believing in the creed that they're going to be reciting the congregation in a few hours. So this is Martin kind of saying, you know, this whole natural philosophy thing. Yeah, it's no longer a thing for me. So I'm kind of wondering myself, you know, is Martin losing interest in everything? Uh, he's certainly not lost interest in money. He, you know, perhaps he's gained, you know, even more of an interest there. And, and I'm starting to wonder if maybe money, maybe if this, you know, his past interaction with Clarissa are starting to supplant his faith as well as his interest in natural philosophy. Huh. So so what do you think a Hahnemann's petrol is that? Is that, uh, is that something that's just a passing natural history reference or are we meant to infer something special from the connection to, to Hahnemann, whoever he may be? Yeah, well, Ian, this is this is a wild one. This is one of those ones where it was like, wait a minute, okay, you know, I don't even need to look that up because when you know when O'Brien makes a bird reference, he's a birder, you know, he knows this stuff. But in fact, I can't find Hanneman's petrol anywhere, and and in one website even devoted to the birds in the canon goes, yeah, we can't find this, and then they were looking for an ornithologist or somebody who you know named Hanneman. Nothing, nothing. So no hits is an actual no. bird, which means that I, I don't think, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me for O'Brien to make up a bird. He he would know that. So it says this may be a special Easter egg. So, you know, we put on our extra special hard searching hat and we go, well, you know, here's kind of a few potential connections. Samuel Hanneman who's like 1755 to 1843, is a German physician best known for creating, you know, what people would say, the pseudoscience of alternative medicine called homeopathy. Ah, okay. Now, you know, you kind of think, well, I mean, so it is Hahnemann, and there are not that many, you know, kind of famous Hahnemanns at the time. You know, what might he have been pointing to here? Well, we also learned that Hahnemann's inspirations for his theory of homeopathy come from examples well known to Stephen Matron. You know, mercury is used to treat syphilis. If you give people who don't have syphilis mercury, they get syphilis like symptoms. Yeah. You know, same thing. Peruvian bark, which Stephen uses, treats malaria. We talked about these both before. If you give it to people who don't have malaria, it causes malaria-like symptoms. So um, 
Hahnemann was using this principle of like treats like. So, you know, you know if, if, um, if there's something that produces a set of symptoms in a healthy individual, it may be able to treat a sick individual who manifests a similar set of symptoms. Mm. And so he and his followers start saying, well, let's take some of this stuff that can, you know, really produce some pretty intense symptoms in people because that must have like a really good healing power in somebody else. We'll figure out what those symptoms are, write them down, and then kind of match it up to the disease that you can use this stuff for. But part of that is that, you know, some of these things like hellebore with another example, you know, we know another one of Stephen's medicines is one they would want to try, but these things can be really deadly toxic. So what yeah. they started doing was this dilution, a dilution principle that say they kind of shake it up in a bunch of alcohol, really reduce it down. And they believe that you can not only, you know, they could get a feel for what the symptoms are without killing themselves, but they also believe that you could take this diluted version and use this to treat the sick people. So, you know, all right, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, Ian. So Go this is, is some kind of stretch here. Is this some <laughs> sort of, if you will, social homeopathy? Yeah. <laughs> now, is this chapter about instances where a little bit of something that could be dangerous in excess to many, perhaps, you know, some people, is actually helpful to some, you know, a, a smaller class of people. So I'm thinking, mm. all right, all right. So how would we, you know, I don't know. The only example that comes immediately to mind here where this chapter has been in the last chapter is like the effect of money. Yeah. So here we get, you know, Martin and Dutord and Stephen. So, you know, money seems to have quite the influence on Martin and Dutord. You know, he's yeah. here's this, you know, Martin we know. We've just talked about him and money. Dutord is this guy that has all these equalitarian principles but then has no qualms with just knocking somebody over the head in order to establish his colonies, has no qualms saying, you know, no, I'm no pirate, but, oh, I take ships whenever I want because it helps my good deeds. <laughs> you know, and yeah, so we, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're kind of wondering what's going on here. And Stephen, who we know, has inherited a fortune, but it's still Stephen. The biggest thing on him is, you know, I might take a coach now and then or something or, you know, I'm going to give away a little bit more here. Um, but we'll return to this later. I suspect, though, let's watch this whole thing about money, about religious sex, about the impact of religion. If you are, you know, we've already introduced this whole religiosity, Holy Joe, yeah. um, philosophy, politics, fundamentalism, you know, extremism versus like, is there a beneficial impact of smaller doses of some of this stuff like faith and hope and joy? I don't know, but I think it's something to play with here. Very yeah. good. And Mike, I dare say, and this is another long reach here, there might also be a connection with petrols. So we know Hahnemann's petrol doesn't exist, but there's another source, right? Um, there's an 1839 book called Curiosities of Medical Experience by J.G. Millingen, um, who wrote this kind of narrative account of all these curious things going on in, in, in medicine. Um, one of the first books written in English to recognize Hahnemann and also a book with a passage about petrels, <laughs> about how they digest their food and how they discharge oil and how they must therefore be kind of bilious or spiteful subjects that presage of foul weather and semen. So this quite sort of fanciful description of petrels and how they behave and what that means for semen. And appearing in the same book as I mentioned of Hahnemann, and Mike, another long reach here. I've no idea if it's real or not, but it's quite fun, isn't it, to think of a Brian might have picked up a copy of Millingen's book, read about petrels. We got petrels back in Desolation Island, and you might have stuck a, you know, a bookmark on this thing about Hahnemann, waiting for a moment to come back to Hahnemann, choosing, as you say, Mike, the moment here where um, money and religion are the things that we we might value in small amounts, or we might not value in larger amounts. Right. And, and, you know, this petrol thing, actually, part of, I think, his conversation there is about how, like, you know, owls can only eat certain things. And if you give them something else, it'll kill them. You know, yeah. all these other birds. But these petrels, no matter what you feed them, they survive. And they somehow distill oil from it because they can take any of it and produce oil and give it to their young. So it's like, 
oh, it's almost this kind of homeopathic-like difference. Something in their system is different than other birds. So, yeah. you know, I don't know. So, yeah. And, and like you said, Ian, this whole thing about petrels and, you know, being omens of, of darkness ahead, you know, it's, it works on so many different levels. I love that. I love that fine. Yeah. Super, super deep. Well, let's just think about this for a second. We got to this point because Martin had said that he no longer bothered at the sight of a, of a Hahnemann's petrol. And S- Stephen picks up this theme. He says, well, I'm reminded of a cousin who of mine who woke up one morning no longer in love with the woman that he'd proposed to. And we, we get into this little disquisition on marriage. And Martin asks, what did he do? And Stephen says, the guy married the woman. And w- was the marriage happy? Asks Martin. Stephen asks a question in return. Do you know of many happy marriages among your acquaintances? And Martin says, he does not but brags a little bit that his own marriage is very happy and will be happier still, he says, with the prize money from Franklin. Back to Nathaniel Martin's theme of the week here. Martin says that he wonders if with such a wife, his parish, his preferred position for the richer parish coming, if he's then justified in leading what he calls his present wandering life, delightful though it may be on such a day as this. So this is kind of odd here. We've gone from Stephen telling Martin that he'll have to leave the surprise when they get home, to Martin now seeming to say, well, it may no longer be justified for me to stay on, questioning this wandering life, the the major element of which he just said no longer pleases him, the Hahnemann's petrol birding connection, to go home to his money and his marriage that that will be all the better with the new position and the prize money. And and another big fling in the chapter here at the institution of marriage, certainly as, as reflected on by Stephen and by Martin, both of them seemingly believing that happy marriages are a rarity. And Stephen telling a story that seemed to echo the earlier jokes that the ransomers were making about uh, um, an engagement not being worth it because the wife turns out to be too smart. Uh, Lots of parallel foreboding here about lots of the different institutions and themes in in the book. Well, Stephen and Martin head off for their invitation to coffee with the captain. And Jack receives Martin over cordially because, O'Brien tells us, he really doesn't like him very much, and he feels that he doesn't invite him as often as he should. So this guilt is kind of turned into, let me be just overly solicitous here. He asks Martin how he is, and he asks if there's any news of his instrument. And I, I, I thought this was an interesting wording here, not as your viola coming along. It's any news of your instrument. I thought, is this is this a little O'Brien double entendre after Martin's involvement with Clarissa? You know, I don't know. Who knows? Uh. But Jack asks because the Franklin had a French instrument repairer aboard who's been working on Martin's instrument here. It's almost fixed, Martin says. And Jack says, oh, that's, you know, wonderful. We'll have to have more music together and, quote, one of these days, end quote. And I couldn't help but pick up, you know, not (laughs) as soon as it's ready, not what do you say to Friday night, but one of these days. So, right. that, that, that's a very English response. Oh, we must get together for lunch one of these days is English for, yeah, you might like to get to lunch, but it's never going to happen. <laughs> oh, well, if, if only, if only people understood each other. Jack says that he remembers that Martin knows about all these different religious persuasions and maybe therefore can give some advice about all these different sects. Martin says he does know something from translating a, a Muller's great book, I might, we just let's just pause for a minute and think about what this great book might be. Um, that venerable source of our own, the Patrick O'Brien Muster book, suggests that this might refer to somebody called Samuel Muller, a German Dutch historian's book about the Anabaptist sects of the 16th century. Maybe somebody else. Jack asks then what he knows about nipper dollings in general. Nothing personal about the ship's nipper dollings. He's not inviting Martin to indulge in personal reflections here. Uh, Martin says that the original nipper dollings were followers of Bernard nipper dolling, a monster Anabaptist. And Nathaniel Martin goes on and describes them here that he went to such very ill-considered lengths enforcing equality and the community of goods and then going on to polygamy with worse things following. However, very politely, Martin says they left little in the way of doctrinal posterity which is very English speak for they died out. And he says that those now using the name of Nipper Dollings are actually descended from the Levellers, a party with very strong egalitarian Republican views prevalent in England at the time of the Civil War, 200 years before where we are now. 
The levelers wanted no differences in rank, everybody equal, all land held in common, no private ownership of property. They had earned a very bad name and they'd been put down at the time of the, uh, uh, the English Civil War. They had a social and political unity, not a religious one, but some remaining communities had formed a sect with strange notions of the Trinity and dislike of infant baptism, picking up this name, calling themselves Nippodollings to avoid persecution as levelers with no notion really of the original beliefs of the Nippodollings other than a general idea of social justice. So Mike, now, now we see why it's interesting to have Vidal the Nippodolling at the same gun room dinner table as Dutour because they've both got this orientation towards equality and, you know, property held in common. Yeah, with Granger the Nippodolling, you know, with other, you know, the bosun being, uh, you know, a family member, probably a Nippodolling. Yeah. Uh, so we've got, oh man, exactly. It, it's interesting that Nippodolling, according to Merriam-Webster here, says that Nipperdalling once was used as a derogatory synonym for an Anabaptist mm -hmm. and now generally refers to any person who's a religious fanatic. So that's, you know, without even going into that original, which Martin's already given us a lot, it's like, hmm, fanaticism, fanaticism. Okay. You know, we had a lot of fanatics in the room here. <laughs> Sounds like a worry, right? Right. And now Stephen observes how remarkable it is that the surprise is such a peaceful ship, given her many sects, gratuitous or otherwise. Um, he suggests, with an interesting little glance at traditional naval establishment here, that if they used round plates rather than square plates with their four corners, they'd have even fewer differences. He says, generally speaking, there is no discord at all, whereas often the least difference of opinion leads to downright hatred. And he's making a joke here about the fact that na naval plates are indeed square with corners, and if you beat somebody about the head you could cause them an injury with the corner of your plate one of the origins of the idea of three square meals a day a square meal is a meal that you get oh. served to you as a, a board ship here and, and here i'm thinking about you know king author and the round table because you know we're not being contentious with one another <laughs> all right no no this is all about whether you can break somebody's head with, the, with the corner of your square plate here now Martin suggests that maybe things are peaceful on board because they leave their observances on shore. For example, we heard of, uh, a chapter or two ago about the Traskites being non-pork eaters. And he says in Shelmiston, they won't eat ham, but they'll all eat salt pork on board the Surprise and they'll eat fresh ham too when they can get it. They're happy to sing the Anglican Psalms and hymns at Sunday service as well, despite what their kind of home-based uh, feelings about ritual might be. Jack says that he doesn't dislike a man for beliefs especially if he's born with them, he can get along with very well with it, with everybody, Jews or even... Uh, and then the text says here, the P of Papist was already formed and the word was obliged to come out as Pindus. <laughs> I'm right, we, we can't find evidence for the Pindu sect anywhere. Yeah, no, so, no, we, no, no, we cannot. <laughs> so Jack, Jack's in quite a quandary here. I'm sure Stevens picked up on this already. But just then, author Weedle... A ransomer, Reed's age, who lives with the midshipmen, falls through the skylight, you know, shattered glass into the cabin. Ever since you know, Weedle joined Reed and Norton, Norton, you know, O'Brien tells us was kind of big for his age, was bashful. And, you know, he and Reed had not been this big energetic thing now. But with the three of them, with Weedle's addition, the three boys are now making the noise of 30. They're playing all over the ship, although nobody's ever, you know, crashed through the skylight before. And then Jack, I love that Jack just, you know, you know, makes sure he's okay. And then he calls for Lieutenant Granger and has each of the three midshipmen sent up a different masthead until he calls for them. <laughs> and meanwhile, Jack calls for the carpenter. He's got some things on his mind, right? Yeah. Sp spoken like an experienced father and an experienced captain of young midshipmen. <laughs> yeah. And, and a guy that spent a lot of time up the masthead as a youth. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, the midshipmen are up at the masthead, back down on deck. Stephen tells Jack he's never known such pleasant weather in this torrid zone. He's seen these Harlem as petrols, maybe three of them. This, this three thing is a clue. O'Brien giving us a clue about the numbers of things we should look out for. Jack says, this is all great, but we're not sailing fast enough and we can't leave the Franklin behind, her being such a dull sailor with her present rig. And he expresses the hope that Mr. Bentley, the carpenter, and the, the, the ransomer carpenter as well, can soon replace the Franklin's really crummy jury rig with something 
as he describes it, more like solid as the Ark of the Covenant so that they can take advantage of the breeze. Jack, to egg himself on here, has sworn that he's not going to touch his fiddle until the royals are set. Stephen says, well, you, you seem to be in such a great hurry to reach Peru. And, and by the way, we know Stephen's in a hurry too because of the whole cocaine, coca leaf situation. Jack says, well, you'd be in a hurry too if you knew how little food, how little water and what little supplies we have left. Stephen suggests that they could leave a little water with the Franklin so that the surprise can sail briskly onto Peru with Tom Pullings following behind later. And Jack said, no, 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 I have a plan. My plan is to arm the Franklin with carronades. These are the carronades that are in the, uh, in the bilges of the surprise here. To sail in company with the Franklin and snap up China ships, whalers and fur traders, Jack would then send the surprise into Callao with Tom and with any prizes and with Stephen as well, so Stephen can look after his affairs ashore, while Jack, meanwhile, cruises offshore, sending in prizes from time to time. Jack's got this whole scheme worked out in his head here. And that's why Jack is so eager to see the Franklin looking like a Christian ship, so that she can play her role in this little squadron exercise that Jack's got going on. And Stephen, who, of course, thinking about those coca leaves, says, I'm looking forward to, I can hardly wait. And Jack is feeling very benign and very optimistic here. Without so much as reaching for a belaying pin, he says, possess yourself in patience for a day or two and we will see her set her royals. Then that evening we shall have a concert. We may even sing. There's a threat. Ah, well, O'Brien tells us that Stephen's been at sea long enough to, you know, even develop at least a little weak superstition. And, and Stephen is surprised to hear Jack's statement so thoughtlessly tempting fate by not adding, you know, if we're lucky or the weather's permitting, you know, to say, you know, just be patient. Two days, boom, this is happening. And he's therefore not surprised when in the morning, Mr. Bentley's foot is hit by a falling top mall and, you know, confining him to his cot. So, you know, we had all these big plans. I've had the carpenter in. Now the carpenter, you know, can't work. So the crew is now working with this carpenter who had been ransomed, you know, on the Franklin. But this guy has got a Yorkshire dialect. It's incomprehensible for the Shelmerstonians. And they look upon him, O'Brien tells us, with dislike and suspicion as little better than a foreigner, a French dog or a Turk. And so, you know, here, you know, again, we've got a little insight into some of the sources of tension and potential tension going on here between these religious sects, uh, all this dislike and suspicion of anything that's strange. But you know what? It's funny. We don't say different. You know, we've already got that value add there, you know, yeah. Instead of different things or people, strange things and people. And, you know, as a result of working under this carpenter with the Yorkshire dialect, all the work slows way down. So, you know, seems like, aha, you know, Jack tempted fate. This is what we get. Yeah, it's what you get for having a carpenter from Grimsby. But we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll pass over that. Um, Stephen, meanwhile, is often going down to Mr. Bentley, the surprise's own carpenter's cabin, to dress his foot, the one that was hit with the top maul, and he hears Dutour in his closed cabin, talking to the bosun. He is in visiting Granger or Vidal, talking to groups of forecastle men. And this is the easygoing, charming, stoic, but outward-looking Dutour here. Is he up to something, or is he just being a warm-hearted guy? Hmm. Stephen notes that when Dutour is speaking to a group, unlike his usual mellow and charming one-on-one -on -one conversation, he tends to address people in a booming tone and goes on and on. They don't seem to dislike it, Stephen thinks, even though there is little new to be said about equality, the brotherhood of man, the innate goodness and wisdom of human nature unoppressed. But Stephen's clearly, he's, he's been skeptical of Dutour for a while, and this is really coming to the fore now. He's actively suspicious, I think, of Dutour and what he's up to and what his motivations might be. But... Stephen's not in a position of moral strength here. And he remembers that those nipper dollings were used to much longer discourses. You might even say we're used to some sermonizing back home. So there's, there's this person preaching at very least the equality of man around about the ship. He's warmly welcomed in the ship, at least among the members of the gun room. Mike, I seem to remember there's Jack at some point in the past saying something about anarchy. Am I right? Yeah. 
yeah, you know, and, 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 you know, when I hear this stuff about I'm taking all the crew and saying, you know, the goodness and wisdom of human nature unoppressed, uh, those words just ring out of my ear. You've come to the wrong shop for anarchy, brother. So uh, I don't know, maybe it's just us, but aboard a, aboard a king's ship, do these words sound a little bit like anarchy? Mm. Coming from a cove with a French surname, you know. Right, well, right. I think while we ponder on everybody's uh, different motivations and ambitions here, it's probably time to ponder on our own and step away for a short break. And we will be right back in just a few moments. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. So Bentley realizes that if he stays in bed much longer, the newcomer on the Franklin's going to get credit for the Franklin's almost completed main mask here, right? <laughs> I love this idea that he kind of a little bit jealous. This sounds a bit like a moment from something like Sergeant Bilko, you know, dragging himself from his sickbed to make sure that they, the officer gets the right idea of who's really in charge around here. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, he heads back to the Franklin, uh, and, and it turns out to be the same day that they're burying their remaining dead. They hadn't been together long enough, O'Brien tells us, to form a united crew, so there's, there's little ceremony and even less mourning, although Detour says a few words here. Now, all of the Franklin's crew by this time has volunteered to be temporary surprises, and O'Brien adds, mainly it was thought for the tobacco. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, you know, we've, you know, our loyalties go so far as you've got tobacco and we don't. So, <laughs> yeah. And Stephen takes the carpenter Bentley over and he brings Martin and his mended viola back. You know, his medical duty, Martin's medical duty aboard the Franklin is now complete. You know, these the final patients have died here. And most of the surprises crew has been brought over to help with this great effort of, of, you know, kind of swapping out, you know, this jury rigged you know, mask and rigging for this new stuff that they've made. But they've come not only to help with that great effort, but because they're going to have to improvise how they do it, having used up so many of the supplies. And they're there to clean up the wreckage if there's an accident, if this all goes wrong here. And so the surprise now being much quieter, Stephen takes advantage of the quiet to, you know, continue his, his, you know, ongoing letter to Diana. Yeah. And, and maybe his epistolary conversation with Diana is the only conversation he can have at the minute around the place and say what's really on his mind about Dutour, because Dutour is getting some currency here. He's getting some pool with everybody. Stephen tells Diana that Martin had been happier messing with Tom over on the Franklin. This is now becomes a bit of a disquisition on Martin's character here, but I'm not sure that it's only Martin that's on his mind as he's writing. Um, the gun room's addition of another ransomer mate and a loud-voiced, confident mirth of a merchant, both of these things, had distressed Martin. He comments about how without Tom to preside over the mess, the gun room was becoming more like an inferior Plymouth tavern. This sounds a little bit, actually, like some of the prejudice that we got from Weston Davidge, but never mind. Dutour does seem to impose some respect but as Stephen writes, it keeps straying onto philosophy, bordering on politics. And here's this, the description from Stephen. Being of the utopian, pantasocratic kind, and the religion, a sort of misty deism, both of which distress Martin. The poor fellow regrets Dutour's absence and dreads his presence. And I think my pantasocratic means one where everybody keeps an equal position and misty deism, meaning that the, the creator is no longer intervening in the universe, the, the, like the, the watchmaker winding it up and setting it going. Those messmates have spent a long time cooped up with each other. And it seems even longer, says Stephen, when members of the gun room belch, fart and scratch themselves. Yeah, yeah, we agree, Stephen. <laughs> Martin, he says, will be likely be much happier when Tom Pullings returns, when the prize is sold, and also when Jack returns from his adventures. So there's the suggestion here that all is not well in Stephen's mind. He goes on and writes that there'll always be prejudice in the hearts of the seamen against Martin since he's a cleric. And now that he has two livings, two parishes providing him an income, the prejudice has grown. He could 
help the sects when they argue over theology because they don't know the source language languages. They don't know Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, whereas Martin does. But Martin is opposed to dissent, to nonconformist, non-Anglican Protestantism. He favored episcopacy, that is to say the appointment of bishops, tithes, church taxes, and infant baptism. And we've already learned, and we can certainly infer, that those things are all pretty abhorrent to all the members of the Sethian sect. Now, Martin's known as a good and kind man. He's been very, very kind as a surgeon's mate, but he's still not cordially liked. He has been poor, but he's now rich by lower deck standards, and they seem to suspect him of over-elevation, of being a bit above himself. And most of all, Mike, it seems that it, it's known that, as we've heard many, many times before, many books before, the captain's not overly fond of Nathaniel Martin. Never been disrespectful, but not personally fond. And that, again, gets Martin looked upon with a bit less consideration than Stephen thinks he deserves. And wrapping up this little meditation on Martin's character, Stephen writes, Martin has not accomplished the feat of making a friend of his friend's closest associate. The attempt is rarely successful, I believe. And perhaps Martin never even ventured upon it. I'm like, that's a, that's a really interesting thing. Making a friend of your friend's closest associates. How often does that happen? Right. It's pretty rare. This is one of the things I just find, you know, you're just reading along in O'Brien and then there's just, you know, one of these gems buried in here. Like just, just another line about Martin. And I thought, oh, this is so good, right? Yeah. How often, like you say, is it successful? And this, you know, kind of final indictment, perhaps Martin never even ventured upon it, never even tried. So it's kind of like, boy, we really are, you know, the, the devolution of Martin is, it seems, you know, you know, almost complete here. Yeah. Gloomy times for Martin's character. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's interesting to me too, that these religious sects from Shelmerston, you know, they all have these issues with each other, but, you know, they're, so many of their beliefs are against what Martin believes. So it's like, by way of telling us, all right, these guys who are at each other's throats actually believe a lot of the same things. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I don't, you know another interesting observation here, and one of the things that they all believe is that they hate ties. You know, they, <laughs> you know it's a tax which they all hate, and which Martin is now they know going to be receiving from their parishes. So Martin is like, boom, yeah, persona non grata. This has got a bit of an air of Monty Python and the life of Brian here. You know, the, the Judean people's friend. And you've got to really hate the Romans. Yeah, we'll see. Right, <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, Martin's losing, uh, Stephen tells Diana, his pleasure in birds, in marine creatures, and in natural philosophy. And therefore, in Stephen's opinion, has no business on the ship because he's an educated man. And the only educated men that should be on ships are sailors. You know, what else would any other educated man want to be doing there if he's not a natural philosopher here? Now, Stephen says in earlier commissions, when Martin was penniless, he loved these things. And so Stephen says, you know, it's it's an easy answer to kind of reach for this as the cause, but he blames Martin's prosperity. Stephen thinks that Martin probably exaggerates the happiness that money is going to bring him. And he, he probably sees it as a compensation for all his disappointments at sea, you know, that things have not worked out for him with the crew, as a cleric, as a parson with Jack. And Stephen, you know, as he's, he's kind of holding his pen up, thinking about this and about to write the next line to Diana, Clarissa Oakes comes to mind. And yeah. Stephen's not writing now. He's thinking about Martin's ambiguous relationship with her, which may have also deeply influenced some people's opinion of Martin. You know, because and Stephen's thinking to himself, O'Brien writes, if a parson sinned, and Stephen was by no means convinced of it, writes O'Brien, no. his sin was multiplied by every sermon he preached. And so they're wow. thinking, whoa, whoa, we know what you did, and you're sitting here telling us how to behave. And so this, this whole conversation again about sexual morality and immorality, and, and we heard a chapter or two ago, Martin saying, you know, he certainly no longer wants to tell anybody about, you know, theology, but certainly not about morality. So even Martin, I think, is condemning himself with this here. So Stephen continues, you know, he doesn't write anything about Clarissa, but in writing to Diana, he says, yet like so many poor men, he almost certainly mistakes the effect of wealth upon happiness in anything but the first fine flush of possession. He speaks of money very much more often than he did, more often than is quite agreeable. 
and the other day referring to his marriage, which is as nearly ideal as can be, he was so thoughtless to say it would be even better with his share of our current prize money. And I think, you know, this is this is not only a great comment about Martin and his relationship and money and marriages. I think it's also Stephen reflecting back on his relationship with Diana and remembering, you know, I can't help but remember Diana in Sweden saying, oh, you know, not only just to have the man I love, but to find out that he's rich too. Oh. And you know, Stephen probably thinking to himself, yeah, so how is that working out now? But, <laughs> you know, Stephen hears Martin as he's writing this, playing his viola, and it hears a true ascending scale and then a slower, more hesitant coming down Ending, O'Brien writes, in a prolonged, slightly false B-flat, infinitely sad. And I'm thinking, wow, boy, doesn't this, you know, is this the arc of Martin's you know, life a little bit here? Yeah, very good. Yes, Stephen <laughs> finishes saying, I do not have to tell you, my dear, that although I speak in this high ascetic way about money, I do not, never have, despise a competence. It is the relation of superfluidity to happiness that is my text. And I am holier than thou only after 200 pounds a year. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, yeah, Stephen's kind of saying, you know, yeah, it's, you know, this is, this is me with a lot of money kind of making these comments. But I guess, you know, I, 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 I'm well aware of that. And I couldn't help it, this superfluidity, you know, an unnecessary or excessively large amount. This sounds like a, a little bit of an echo back to our homeopathic dilution principle. Oh, yeah. You know, some of this can make a big difference. Too much of this, perhaps, It'll kill you, kill you, or kill your relationship, or kill your interest. Yeah. Well, having reached a pause in the letter writing, Stephen has a little snooze on the stone window locker, and he's woken up by the stamp of feet and the sound of orders as the surprises boats are hoisted in. And instead of the usual shouts and avast and belay, there's a good-natured cheer. So something something better is happening on the ship here. Uh, Stephen wonders what it could be, and he realizes that Emily and Sarah, the sweeping girls, are standing there in their white pinafores. The captain says, should you like to see a marble? A wonder, said Emily. Marble, said Sarah, adding, you impotent booby. I'm like, I, I, I love the humor here. I love the fact that the girls break the rather gloomy and dry tension in the room. I love the fact that they've got their own little Aubreyism that they've heard from somebody else. Impotent, not incompetent. And uh, this marble, what the heck? What, what kind of a marble can it be? And of course, it's Marvel. So coming up on deck to see the said Marvel slash marble, Stephen is asked by Jack whether he's been asleep. Stephen says, no, I rarely sleep. And we get another little hark back to the idea that we've had before that Stephen's not a, a sleeper. Well, said Jack, if you had been asleep, here is a sight that would wake you even if you were up a letter to the Ephesians. Look over the leeward quarter. The leeward quarter. And Stephen's enough of a seaman to have acquired some of this weak superstition from earlier on, but uh, not a yet a certain knowledge of windward versus leeward. Um, Mike, how might you be a letter to the Ephesians? Yeah, I, you know, I, I was like, what? But I, clearly it's a reference to sleeping and how, you know, this old joke too, Stephen saying, you know, nobody ever says they were asleep. They will never admit that. Like, they, they, you know, but in letter of Ephesians, I think Jack's referring to chapter five, verse 14. So, and I'm going to come on to that in just a second, but let me set it up just a little bit, because I think this is another one of O'Brien's thing where, you know, I'm going to give you this verse, which absolutely applies, but take a look at what's around it, because that might inform the story a little bit. So Paul's already in this chapter five said that, you know, we were all once in darkness. We were not living the way God wants us to in the light, you know, with goodness and righteousness and truth, doing things that please the Lord. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but where we found those deeds to bring them into the light, because everything that you bring into the light is made visible. And I'm, boy, I'm thinking about the Clarissa Oaks and, you know, all this yeah. stuff that's, you know, happening in the darkness and everything, um, as well as perhaps what's going on with Detard and the, the, some of the crew members. Are, but anyway, bring it into the light. So everything brought into the light is made visible and everything that is illuminated becomes light. So if we can, you know, see it and deal with it, you know, we can you know, make it better here. Well, 
Then comes Jack's verse where it says, it says, that is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. So I think this is Jack's ah, reference that, you know, you even if you've been asleep, you see this site, this is going to shine on you. You're going to, you'll be really awake here. But, you know, perhaps the reference goes even a little deeper because when Paul was talking about the two main fruits of darkness, he really underscores sexual immorality and greed. So we know Martin is having major issues uh, around these, and they've really been running rampant on the ship lately. The whole immoral, if you will, sex with Clarissa and the effect on everybody, all the surprises O'Brien keeps mentioning are taking every opportunity to recalculate all their prize money and thinking about going back to Dutard and, you know, all the riches I have are over there in the Franklin here. Anyways, so I will say that I, I think all that informs the chapter, and I, I can't help because we're in chapter five of Ephesians that say, also at the end of this, some of you may know, is, is Paul's famous advice on how husbands and wives should treat each other. Now, oh. a kind of, you know, people have real contentions and issues about this stuff, and, and I certainly don't know how O'Brien or Mary would have read and understood that part, because people understand it differently. Yeah. But marriage is the key topic here. So we're talking about Martin and Jack and Stephen, and, and I'd just love to put it to them. Do they love their brides the way Christ loves the church? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. <laughs> That's really good, Mike. I uh, it reminds me of the uh, the John Donne sermon that we had uh, in the previous book, where if you read a little before and a lot afterwards, you get a lot of this context that sounds like it's not an accident. Really the same thing here. Okay, let's go. Let's all go dig out Ephesians for a bit of homework here. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you so much. And St Stephen replies to this biblical allusion with, 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 with a piece of petty blasphemy that every Irish person in literature ever since the dawn of man has, has used. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, cried Stephen. I had to do it in the Irish accent there. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and the little donkey, said Stephen. <laughs> he didn't say that. I just put that in but for, for fans of a famous BBC uh, police drama. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, cried Stephen, recognizing the Franklin at last. What a transformation. She has three tall Christian masts and a vast great number of sails. What splendor in the sun. Sails of every kind, I make no doubt, including top gallant royals. Yeah. That's a, a maturinism, Aubreyism. There's no such thing as a top gallant royal, but never mind. Exactly so. Ha ha ha. I never thought it could be done in the time. She spread them not five minutes ago, and already she's gained upon us a peg cable's length. And Jack, very, very fine here with all of Stephen's uh, misunderstandings and misnomers here. He's just super impressed that this work got done so quickly. He orders the surprise his own royals sent up. Granger once again favoring his nephew George in the orders. And the surprises and the Franklins both cheer each other as the royals flash out. Ain't that capital? We can have our concert at last, cries Jack. Stephen answers, very capital indeed, uh, upon my soul. And he's he's really not sure why they're all so delighted. Poor, poor old Stephen, still, still the landlubber. And, and, and it sort of continues here. Reed heaves the log and reports out two knots and a trifle better than one fathom, sir, if you please. And Jack thanks Reed and asks Stephen if he isn't amazed. Stephen says, well, profoundly amazed, yet I seem to remember having gone even faster <laughs> than two knots. Right. Jack explains, no, 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 I'm talking about the relative speed, making two knots in a mild zephyr like this, as, as O'Brien writes, an air that would scarcely bend a candle flame, means, according to Jack, there is precious little can escape us without it has wings or carries 74 guns. And somebody in the waist cries out, hear him, hear him. And you know, right behind Jack, the helmsman and the quartermaster can't help but chuckle a little here. <laughs> Very good. Uh, there's there's always room in any chapter for a little bit more misunderstanding on Stephen's part about what's happening uh, in the ship. Stephen then asks Jack if he has anything in particular in mind for their concert. And Jack remembers that back in the days on the Sophie, Stephen used to say, let no new thing arise, which I think is an old kind of Catalan blessing. Uh, and he thinks it's good advice for the Navy. And uh, by the way, it's good advice in O'Brien's heart as well, because he was a right neophobe with Patrick O'Brien. He, he liked conservative, ancient, backward-looking things when it came to his taste in music. Anyhow, he decides that they're going to start with the violin and cello duet in C minor of Benda. 
and they pick up this duet and they play it. They play it unusually well, partly due to the fact that we have a steady deck, unlike what we had in chapters one and two, a steady deck under the cello and a cheerful heart behind the fiddle. So Mike, I, I took it upon myself to do the usual thing and look up how, how real a reference this might be. Franz Bender, a German-Austrian composer of mostly violin and orchestra music, not terribly prolific back in the uh, early 18th century. Certainly a composer that might have written the piece that we're talking about here, but not clearly any pieces immediately written for just violin and cello. There are some sonatas, though, for violin and cello and harpsichord. And uh, there's a really nice one in C minor. So let's have a little listen here to what some bender in C minor might really sound like. So there you go. One, one of the very, very rare pieces on YouTube of uh, music by Franz Bender. Very nice it is too. They would have brought, says the text, they would have brought this piece to an unusually handsome close if Killick hadn't walked in, tripped over a stool and barely saved their supper. The lack of supplies had turned their toasted cheese into a pap of ship's biscuit, goat's milk and a little rock hard cheese rind rasped over the top and browned. And as usual, Jack and Stephen split the dish in proportion to their relative weight, which I'm pretty sure clearly favours Jack Aubrey. Um, Jack goes on and explains the likelihood of being better, faster sailing ahead, slanting down towards the equator. So he's quite optimistic about the weather conditions here. And to cheer things up, because the minor key is quite sad, maybe Stephen suggests one of their old favourites, Boccherini in D major. Jack says, one of our favourite phrases, I should like it of all things and calls for some port. And Killick says there's only Jack's feast day 89 bottle left. Stick a pin in 89. Jack says, okay, bring it anyway. Let's live whilst we're alive, which is a little bit of an echo, I think, of something that we heard a few chapters ago. That reminds him, he says, of Clarissa. And Jack goes all confessional here. He tells Stephen how shamefully he lusted after her and said, but it would not do, of course, not in my own ship. He believes that Martin was also smitten, as Stephen had been supposing in his letter to Diana a few paragraphs ago. Jack expresses the hope that Clarissa is going to be happy with Mr. Oakes, hoping to have, you know, transfer of good morals onto somebody in this conversation that he's got going on in his head here. It's interesting, Mike, to see how they're all mixing together in their minds the idea of, you know, lusting after sex and desiring money. It's Stephen and his effect on Jack. It's Martin and the crew in general. We've got Clarissa. We've got the class divisions that West had sort of started us out with. We've got us gazing ahead, maybe wondering about what the impact of all this philosophy and politics from Dutour is going to be. Ah, lots, lots to think about here. Anyhow, Mike, Stephen comes back to this mention of Jack and Port and the year 1789. Yeah, Stephen says... Uh... You know, was 89 an uncommon year for port? Jack says, well, it was pretty good, but he really drinks it to remember the Spanish disturbance. Ah, and, and we'll come back to it, but I think that's not what, what Vatron had in mind here. But the Spanish disturbance was a real thing. It's known also as the Nuka crisis or the Spanish armament. And, and Jack explains it for Stephen because he, he's never heard of it here. Jack explains that this fur trading Nootka Sound on the, you know, the North Pacific coast of, of the uh, U.S. and Canada had been discovered by Captain Cook and the British had traded there for years when the Spanish all of a sudden said it was a continuation of California and claimed it for Spain. They sent up a frigate, they seized some English ships there and the English settlement there. And the English people were furious, especially having just lost to the Americans here. And the ministry, you know, in response to this, started rebuilding the navy. And and you know, sailors who'd been turned ashore like Jack were rejoicing here. 
it also meant, and, and one of the reasons Jack loves it, is that later when France declares war on Britain, you know, they're, they're now prepared. And had it not been for the Spanish disturbance, they might have been caught unprepared as, as they were here. And Jack says he owes his promotion to it and he blesses the Spanish disturbance. Now, Stephen notes that Jack's commission came in 1792. He remembers Sophie showing him the, you know, the, the, the document. Yet the wine is from 1789. I think Stephen's trying to go back again. It's just, you know, tell me again, 1789? And Jack says, well, you know, it took him that long for Britain to do the rearmament and for Spain to finally decide to pull in its horns and, and back out of this whole thing. But Jack says, you know, he celebrates 89 because it had changed his hopes from, you know, from when he first heard it, even though he didn't get his commission until a few years later. And then Jack says, well, Stephen, what were you doing in 1789? And uh, yeah, Stephen says rather vaguely, oh, I was studying medicine. And uh, he walks off into the quarter gallery. And if ever there's somebody who's clearly been triggered, this is one of those situations, I think. Um, while that was true, what he didn't tell Jack was that he'd been running about the streets of Paris, getting excited about the dawn of the revolution. And the French Revolution, known in many places as the Revolution of 1789, was was a really, the, the, the pivotal year of it all was 1789. For Stephen, that was a time when he'd been excited about the dawn of revolutionary politics, about the ideas of freedom, the dawn of what he called an infinitely finer age. But 1789 was the year, of course, of the storming of the Bastille. It was the year that the king and queen and the royal family were deposed. They they wouldn't be executed until 1792, the, 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 end of, the date of the end of the Spanish disturbance. But this was a time of unrest. And of course, this was the time, we, we know from previous conversations about Stephen's recollection of the of the politics, this, this would have been the time when Stephen was getting disillusioned with the transition from the idealistic side of revolutionary politics to the ghastly reality of executions and terror and all that went with it. So when Stephen returns, Jack is quietly arranging the score of their next duet on the music stands. And Jack realizes that this was a painful subject to touch on for Stephen, realizes that like a true O'Brien character, Stephen hates questions. And the text says, He was particularly attentive in laying out the sheets, pouring Stephen another glass of wine, and when they begin in so playing that his violin helped the cello, yielding to it in those minute ways perceptible to those who are deep in their music, if to few others. Jack focuses on the music score. He raises his head once the ship starts leaning, and at the end of the allegro, turning his page with his bow, says, she's making four knots. Ah, which is clearly an, an advance on the two and a bit knots that we had earlier on. Stephen suggests that they should attack the next movement, the Adagio, directly. They have the wind behind them. He's extending his metaphor about wind here rather rather generously. Uh, and they have never played better. And the text proves it. They swept into the next movement, the cello booming nobly and carried straight on without a pause, separating, joining, answering one another, with never a hesitation nor a false note until the full satisfaction of the end. Oh, my God. If if there was ever a look ahead to the end of the novel that we're all hoping for, there it is right there. Yeah, it's beautiful. But, you know, in in true O'Brien form, here we've got this, you know, beautiful scene, and the next paragraph starts with, well done, well done, says Dutour to Martin. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute, what? And they're standing, O'Brien writes, in the warm darkness behind the lit companion on the quarter deck. And so it's like, well, oh, wait a minute. We just had we just had Paul of the Ephesians, light, darkness. Jack and Stephen are down in the light. Martin and Detour are up in the darkness, you know, behind yeah. the, the light here. And they're alone except for Granger and a man at the wheel. So, you know, I I think uh, O'Brien's pointing us back here to this light and darkness metaphor. And this idea that at this point, Martin and Detard can speak very confidentially here. You know, nobody's going to really overhear them. Uh, uh, You know, the only people behind them are, you know, now people who seem to be getting along quite well with Detard here. Detard says, I had no idea they could play so well. No contention. No striving for preeminence. Pray, which is the cello? Martin says, Dr. Matron. 
Ah, says Jashard. And Captain Aubrey, the violin, of course. Admirable tone, admirable bowing. Now, you know, O'Brien tells us that Martin, you know, he doesn't like Detard much in the gun room because he talks too much and harangues them with these ideas that Martin says, though no doubt well intended, were pernicious, you know, uh, pernicious meaning harmful, especially in kind of a gradual, subtle way. I think I think O'Brien is showing us Martin, you know, is so naive here, you know, no doubt well intended. Yeah. But Martin does like Detard on tete a tete. Head to head would be the literal translation, but what it really means in private conversation between two people. So, you know, here again, we've got this idea. And so apparently Martin walks out with him in these private conversations fairly often, O'Brien tells us. And he asks if Dutour plays. Well, yes, the text says, I may be said to play. I'm not of the captain's standard, but with some practice, I believe I could play second fiddle to him with out too much discredit. And I thought, ooh, that sounds a little ominous in a way here. Yeah. Um, Martin says, well, do you have your violin with you? Yes, yes, it's in my sea chest. The man who repaired your viola renewed the pegs just before we set off. Do you often play in the cabin? Detard asks Martin. I have done so, though I'm an indifferent performer. I have taken part in quartets. Ah, says Detard. Quartets, what joy! That is living in the very heart of music. Yeah. Well, he, he's a man with some taste, I've got to say. I'm partial to a string quartet myself. But I'm sure there's more going on there than just the enjoyment of the music. Well, it, 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 for me, it, uh, this whole darkness and light thing, you know, what happens when the darkness is brought into the light. But here, I think this is detoured. Quartets are the heart of music. But I really believe he's kind of referring to you know, these you know, down here, a quartet in the captain's cabin would be the heart of the ship. You know, certainly, you know, Stephen and and Jack are the heart of the ship's music. And it sounds to me like he now wants to use Martin to kind of worm his way into that heart. So, you know, Ooh. call me crazy paranoid, but it brings to my mind the heart of darkness here. Oh, you know? wow. Hey, Mike, it, it would be a big thing if there were parallels with Conrad all the way through this. But, but of, of all the writers who've ever written anything about the sea that we haven't yet picked up in connection with Patrick O'Brien. Joseph Conrad's got to be the one. Wow. Huh. What fascinating way to end the chapter here with all this light and dark and all this uncertainty and kind of foreboding about the relationships between people. How, how are we feeling about the surprise? Do we think we're back, back to even keel? You know, I'm, I'm, you know I, I was feeling really good, and now I'm really starting to fear for her. We've got this you know, dissension between these religious sects, but at the same time, you know, all this talk of, you know, having no rank, everything held on in common, everybody, you know, exactly equal, everybody wonderful, except when they're oppressed, you know, this big, large, valuable prize at our side, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried about the surprise and I'm not sure if I'm worried about Martin or kind of giving up on him a little bit. Yeah, good point. Well, Mike, we've got, we've got a lot of questions running here. We're only up to chapter three, but lots and lots to look forward to. What do you say next time to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Oh, I should like that of all things. people back home are furious, you know, having just, you know, lost to, uh, who was that? I guess it was the Americans, right? Yeah. Sorry. That was, that was a bad attempt at a joke. <laughs> Let me do that again, Sam.